Gente, estamos ao vivo, tá? É, talvez no canal é, daquele link inicial não, tenha, não esteja passando, precisa reentrar no YouTube no canal, tá? Mas está passando ao vivo lá no canal. Então podemos começar? Pode sim. Ok. Mike, uh, we should start now, or oh, as I said, okay. a Portuguese introduction and then an English introduction you can, can go on, ok? Ok. So, uh, bom dia a todos, né? Gostaria de dar as boas-vindas aos 30 alunos do primeiro Eximpa desse ano, 2021, uh, bem como para todos os outros alunos, profissionais, aficionados em paleontologia que estão nos assistindo nessa transmissão ao vivo pelo YouTube. O Eximpa surgiu como uma iniciativa de três amigos, três patetas, né? a Lisa, o Renato e eu, e a nossa ideia era trazer uh, novas abordagens no estudo dos fósseis, no estudo da paleontologia, Uh, que frequentemente não são tratados nos cursos de, de graduação e pós-graduação no Brasil e muitas vezes em outros países também. E dessa forma iniciar a capacitação de uma nova geração de paleontólogos brasileiros. Para isso, nessa primeira edição, a gente convidou três jovens, seis jovens especialistas em temas-chave e de fronteira na paleontologia para oferecer três minicursos, uh, aos quais a gente já agradece pela gentileza de nos ajudar e participar do evento. São eles, Flávia Calefo, Lara Maldanes, Rodrigo Horodsky, Daniel Sedorco, Pedro Godoy e Gabriel Ferreira. Uh, o Renato, eu, a Lisa, nem tanto, né? a gente já está velho, né? e a gente entende que é importante que vocês conversem entre si. Então, uh, que o contato com jovens pesquisadores facilite a transmissão de uma nova visão de mundo. Né, que vai moldar aí o estudo da paleontologia pelos próximos anos, e a gente espera que no Brasil não seja diferente. A nossa ideia é que essa escola ocorra anualmente, a gente espera que em breve, de forma presencial, né, e espero que todos que vão ter oportunidade de fazer essa escola esse ano né, tenham duas ótimas semanas aí na companhia de paleontólogos e amigos. Né. Uh, o exemplo não poderia começar melhor uma palestra do paleontólogo Mike Benton, da Universidade de Bristol, um cara que dispensa apresentações por suas inúmeras contribuições à nossa área nos últimos 40 anos, ao qual agora eu vou dar as boas-vindas. Mike, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. The first winter school in paleontology aims to qualify young Brazilian students into new techniques and approaches in paleontology. No one is better than you to provide an introduction to this. This is because even as a senior paleontologist now, you have always been open to explore beyond the realm of digging and describing old bones. In this way, you built a remarkable career and is surely within the gallery of great paleontologists of our time. Um, my undergrad students, they all know you, at least based on their textbooks. I'm very proud of having been your student. I'm very happy to have you delivering this talk to us now. Um, so, the color of dinosaurs and how we know what you know in paleontology. Thank you, Mike. That's on you now. Great. Thank you very much, Max. And um, I just wanted to um, say a brief word before I begin the, the talk. So, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm very sorry I cannot present this in Portuguese. I will hope to speak clearly. Um, and what I'm going to address is how do we know about the stuff we say we know. And until you study the subject of paleontology, you may think when somebody talks about a dinosaur or a fossil plant or a trilobite uh, and talks about the paleobiology, the way they lived, that this is all um, speculation. But in fact, um, I've noted that in the study of dinosaurs, a lot of this is um, thoroughly scientific. We can test it. And I'll show you some examples. And this transition has happened pretty much in my lifetime, as Max has implied. And we started in, in a world where people would declare stuff. This is what we think. That's it. Uh, when now we say here is the evidence. So paleontology has moved largely from 
speculation, guesswork to science. So let, let's, let's have a look at this, and I'll show you some examples. Right. Okay, so the topic I'm talking about uh, is cover, I'm going to use dinosaurs as my example. Um, it, I wrote a book about this a couple of years ago, <clears throat> shown here. And it started with the topic of dinosaur color. Um, but I, I reviewed a variety of other features of dinosaurs. And, and we can call most of these the paleobiology, the, the, the biology of how these creatures lived. And I'll start with color, but we'll also look at feeding and locomotion. You can see there are other key topics that if you were a biologist, uh, you would want to understand. And the important point is we can do this work using the available information, the fantastic fossils we have, the fossil record, the dating of the rocks, and importantly, of course, comparison with modern living uh, forms. And the second thing I noticed when I, I listed out these different examples, let's just look at the key dates when major discoveries were made. Or at least here are some major discoveries. I won't read through all of these, but these are these are the general chapter headings, if you like. These are facts. So that the top left, dinosaurs had feathers with patterns of colorful stripes and blobs. Or down at the, the very last one, which was the extinction of dinosaurs in orange, dinosaurs were in decline for the last 40 million years as climates got colder. And many of these discoveries are quite recent. So here are the dates of key papers. So just to review briefly once and a final time, here are the topics. Here are certain facts that we believe we can prove or we can demonstrate. Uh, and, and here are the dates. So a lot of this is really quite new. So let me take you through a few examples. And I'll, I'll try and limit this then to 45 minutes, uh, uh, 50 minutes, something like that. But before we get into the methods, we must not forget that one of the glories of paleontology is that we have fantastic fossils. So here is a fossil ant in amber a fossil beetle showing some of its original structural color, and a fossil mammal showing evidence of hair and, and internal organs. So we must not forget that we do have a remarkable um, collection of fossils in the rocks, in the museums, and, and they can tell us a huge amount. Just look at the detail of what is preserved here. And here's, here's a, a, a couple of specific examples. Uh, for example, uh, this is a dinosaur in amber. Who would ever have believed that you could find a dinosaur in amber? Of course, it's a small dinosaur. You can see the ants on, on the screen. And of course, you know the size of an ant, maybe one centimeter long. And so this is clearly part of a small dinosaur. In fact, not much bigger than a, it would stand in your hand. Uh, and we're looking at the tail. And at first, you'd think these long, sweeping structures are hairs of some kind. But of course, when you look at them under the microscope on the right, uh, you can see that they show regular branching. Uh, and these are a very particular kind of feather. And in fact, by the way, this is a kind of feather that you don't find in any living bird. Look at the length of these, the fact that they are very flexible, and they remain roughly equal in width from uh, beginning to end. And sometimes remarkable fossils can uh, uh, change our opinion. So here is a paper that we um, published uh, a couple of years ago, which uh, was... Uh, Sorry, which was um, showing what we claim to be feathers in pterosaurs. So pterosaurs are cousins of dinosaurs, so they're not dinosaurs, but they are closely related to dinosaurs. For a long time, it's been known that the pterosaurs had some kind of hair-like structures, often called pycnofibers. And uh, we looked at some specimens from the Middle Jurassic of North China, just like this reconstructed one at the top. And we expected to find um, simple pycnofibers or bristles like letter A and E uh, at the bottom, show, shown with a photograph uh, and, and a simple drawing. 
That was all we expected. But then the more we looked at the specimen, we found some of these had a tuft of little hairs at the end, some had a tuft halfway along, and some, such as DH, uh, show um, branching right from the bottom. And in fact, all these four structures are also seen in dinosaurs, and some of them even in birds as well. And so we say these are probably feathers because they show branching. We know them in birds and dinosaurs. Why would you call them something else? Or why would you assume they have somehow evolved independently, separately? This is still quite controversial. But if it's true, it changes our picture completely of the timing of the origin of feathers and the meaning of the origin of feathers. So until a few years ago, we thought that feathers were unique to birds. And here are birds at the top, uh, originating somewhere in the late Jurassic, about 150 million years ago. And for a long time, the origin of feathers was placed at the same time as the origin of birds. Then, of course, with increasing numbers of fossils found in China, people have shown that feathers occur in theropod dinosaurs, pretty much down to their origin. They've also been reported from ornithischian dinosaurs, and now we're reporting them from pterosaurs. Uh, and so the origin of feathers shifts back into the early Triassic. Uh, and this is a movement of 100 million years, 250 to 150, uh, 150 to 250 million years ago. And so the origin of feathers is nothing to do with the origin of birds, or not the original origin of feathers. Although, of course, feathers are massively important for birds, there's no question. Um, and the origin of feathers is much, to, much more to do with the recovery of life from the end Permian mass extinction, which occurred at 252 million years ago, and the fact that dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and their ancestors were already becoming warm-blooded in some way. But let's move to where the application of methods to these fantastic new fossils can give us information we never believed we could find. So this was a paper we published uh, over 10 years ago, and it was the first observation or the first claim that we were the first to claim that we could tell the color of dinosaur feathers. We could be completely wrong, completely mad, and many people thought we were. How on earth can you tell the color of a dinosaur? But nonetheless, we presented the paper. It was published in Nature, and it was a great collaboration between University of Bristol and uh, the Paleontology Institute in Beijing, and looking at wonderful fossils from the Jurassic and Cretaceous of China. Of course, this discovery created a huge amount of interest, and there were news stories everywhere. Uh, and indeed, it turned out we were not the only people working on this question. Here is our dinosaur at the top left, another group based at Yale University in the States, together with Chinese colleagues, uh, were studying a different dinosaur called Anchiornis, and they noted its remarkable color patterns. So let's look at what we were actually claiming. We are actually saying this reconstruction at the top of this dinosaur, Sinoceropteryx, is wrong, it's incorrect. Whereas the one at the bottom is correct. The fact that it has an orange uh, uh, color over the back, a white belly, and, and ginger or orange and white stripes on the tail, we are saying this is correct. That's quite a claim. We're not saying that because we tr strongly believe it or because we are really clever or really smart. It's because we have evidence. Let's have a look. The evidence comes from observations on modern animals. So in this case, we are looking at a, a zebra finch, which has a variety of colors over its uh, uh, feathers, from black to brown, white, gray, and ginger, this orange ginger color on the cheek. And we took some feathers from a zebra finch. We froze them and cracked them so that we could look at them under the scanning electron microscope. And we confirmed what had been observed many times before, that inside the structure of the feather, and the feather is made of a protein called keratin, within the keratin of the feather are structures called melanosomes. And these melanosomes are like capsules or, or small hollows, structures within the feather that hold the pigment, that hold the color.
And there are two kinds of melanosomes. There are eumelanosomes and pheomelanosomes. So the eumelanosomes are associated with black, brown, gray colors. And so all of the colors over the back and the belly and the head of this um, bird are uh, associated with eumelanin, the pigment, which is held in eumelanosomes, which are the structures in the feather. And under the scanning electron microscope, these look like little sausages up to one micron, one millionth of a meter in length. Whereas in the ginger patch on the cheek, the, the melanosomes are very different. They are not sausage shaped, but they are ball shaped. And they are rather small. They're about half a micron in length. And so these are pheomelanosomes, which give ginger color, only that. And so the two pigments, the eumelanin and the pheomelanin, differ in uh, certain small ways, but clearly they differ enough uh, to give these different colors. And we find this very clear association of the shape of the melanosome with the color that is expressed in the feather. And now I think you could see how you could determine this from an exceptionally preserved fossil. So here is what we call the chain of inference, the, 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 the line of evidence that gives us the, uh, 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 gives us the courage or the, 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 well, gives us the evidence to say this is what the colors were. So uh, on the left is the fossil of Sinoceropteryx. It's a very beautiful and very important um, fossil from the early Cretaceous of North, uh, North China. And when it was described in 1996, the authors noticed that it had a lot of soft tissues. For example, within the rib cage, there's a lot of black organic material, which represents the liver and other internal organs. Uh, there is black melanin, eumelanin in the, uh, the retina of the eye. And then particularly, they notice these feather-like structures along the middle of the back and in tufts, little bunches along the tail. And you can see dark, pale, dark, pale. And so we took samples from the tail and from other parts of the body. We looked at these tiny samples, only about one millimeter, uh, looked at them under the scanning electron microscope, and this is what we saw. Um, we only saw spherical structures embedded within the structure of the keratin. Some of them are solid, like this one here. Mostly they are hollows, they are molds within the structure. But comparing with our example from the zebra finch, we said these are surely pheomelanosomes. We looked at lots of ex samples from the fossil, in this case, we never saw any eumelanosomes. There were all these pheomelanosomes indicating ginger color. So we were using the modern bird as our way to interpret this remarkably well-preserved fossil. And hence, this is our reconstruction with ginger and white stripes on the tail, ginger over the back and the head, and then pale colors over the belly region. And we would say, this is scientific because we have a line of evidence. And if somebody doesn't like what we've said, if they think we're wrong, they don't have to shout at us. They just have to present alternative or better evidence. They have to go and look either at this same specimen of Sinoceropteryx or a different one. They need to take the samples, look at them under their scanning electron microscope to make sure that we're observing correctly and see what they can see. Another argument, of course, could be, well, this is all very well. You've just looked at the zebra finch. How can you be sure that this dinosaur that lived 150 million years ago has got the same relationship between uh, melanosome shape and color? And this is based on the observation that this relationship of melanosome shape and color does not just occur in this one species of bird. It occurs in every one of the 10,000 species of living birds that people have looked at. There are additional colors, of course, people know that. There are many birds have colors that are not generated by melanin. They have pinks and yellows and greens and purples. We're only talking about the melanin colors and we can't at the moment detect the others. However, in all birds that people have looked at, this relationship of eumelanosomes and pheomelanosomes and the sausage shape and the ball shape is constant. Even that would not be enough 
of course, to prove our case, because if dinosaurs are ancestors of birds, which I think most people accept they are, there is no reason that dinosaurs would show the same relationship of colour and um, melanosome shape as in modern birds. It would be likely, but you couldn't say it's proved. The final point is that this relationship of melanosome shape and the colour expressed on the feather actually happen, it actually applies also to mammals. So you'll notice I've written here the colours apply to both feathers and hair. And so if any of you have ginger hair, it's because within your hair structure, within the keratin of the hair, you have phao melanosomes and you have phao melanin giving the ginger color. That's enough to prove the point because in the evolutionary tree, birds and mammals are located at opposite ends of the, uh, the cladogram, the evolutionary tree of um, uh, tetrapods, of amniotes. And anything included between those two, which includes dinosaurs and lots of other fossil uh, reptiles, we will assume shares the same relationship because it is present in the ancestor of all those living forms, as far as we can tell. So that's the scientific evidence for color, which some of you will have known the story. Some of you will have said, this is crazy before I explained it. This is crazy. We can't know the color of a dinosaur. Yes, we can. Secondly, how do we know the speed of a dinosaur? Some of you will know this story. This person is sitting on a fossil trackway. I think it may even be from Bolivia. I can't remember exactly where. But what this person has done is they have swept away all the loose sediment and you are looking at a trackway from the Jurassic dating back more than 150 million years. Um, and yet it looks as fresh as if it was formed yesterday. And there is one big three-toed dinosaur coming from the bottom up to the top, another one going from right to left. And you can see the footprints. This is right, left, right, left, right, left. And so this thing walks up the, the, across the slab. It's evidently going quite slowly because you can see the footprints are quite close together. And yet the animal is quite big because you can see from the size of the footprint you could measure the length of the footprint and estimate the length of the leg of this dinosaur that made the track. Now, just think about it. This is a big dinosaur, much bigger than this, this human being. Uh, and it's, it's walking along with maybe a stride of one or two meters. Um, and yet it looks as if it's moving slowly. If this was a very tiny uh, relative, say something the size of a hummingbird, Moving at this, this speed would be very fast because the, the speed depends on, the, or, or the, the mode of locomotion, the speed is the same, but the mode of locomotion, whether it is walking slowly or whether it is running at full speed, is, is, is related to the size of the animal as well. So across the top here is a formula. Velocity or speed is equal to this relationship here. And the three things you need to measure are gravity, stride length, and hip height. So gravity in the Jurassic, we will assume, is the same as it is today. Stride length, you can obviously measure from your fossil trackway, right to right, or left to left, as you wish. And hip height is what you estimate from the size of the footprint. So we, there is a relationship for each group of animals. And for these dinosaurs, we can quickly work that out. Now, how do we know that this works? The reason we know that it works is that people have used this formula um, to work out the running speed for many different living animals, everything from a human to a horse, uh, a, a, a dog to a frog, uh, animals that move on two legs like an ostrich or cassowary, uh, or that move on two legs or move on four legs like a horse or a dog. And it doesn't matter if it's cold-blooded or warm-blooded, reptile, amphibian, bird or mammal, this always works. So why would it not work for a Jurassic animal? We will assume it does work. And therefore, you can calculate the running speed of any animal for which you have a fossil trackway like this. But not only that, there is a second way to estimate running speed. 
And this is by looking at the skeleton and measuring or uh, uh, estimating the uh, diameter of the leg muscles. This is work by John Hutchinson at the Royal Veterinary College in London. He's an American cit US citizen. And he, a number of years ago, thought about the question of T-Rex weighing six tons and a chicken weighing six tons. Could this chicken run really fast? Because you know a chicken, which normally weighs half a kilo, can run pretty fast. Um, can it keep up that performance if it gets to six tons? The answer is absolutely not, because the relationship between leg muscle size and running speed depends on body size. So in a chicken, maybe 50% of the body mass is devoted to those muscles that power the leg. Think about when you last ate a chicken. The muscles of the leg are pretty substantial. And Hutchinson was working from an assumption that applies to humans and horses and any other animal, that the faster it runs, the bigger the leg muscles. So if you've been watching the Olympics, those, those men and women who run really fast have got massive leg muscles, probably more massive than most of the rest of us. And the volume of the muscle or the diameter of the leg muscle is more or less uh, proportional to the running speed that they can achieve. But there is a limit. You can't keep on making humans run faster or making horses run faster because the leg muscles would just become impossibly large in order to achieve those speeds. And Hutchinson worked out that a sprinting T-Rex, if, if you're a six-ton chicken, maintained the same ability to run fast, its whole body would have to be composed of leg muscles. In fact, it would have to have twice its body weight made of leg muscles, which is clearly not possible. So we have two ways of estimating running speeds for different groups of dinosaurs, and they tend to agree. Both of them are based on well worked out, carefully tested numerical models that we know work today, just like the melanosome argument, we know it works today, so why would it not work in the past? And the same argument is made here, that the laws of physics, gravity, the, the, the power of muscles, the, 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 the strength of a skeleton, all of these features that we can measure in living animals and the living, the modern environment, would have been the same in the Jurassic. It would be crazy to say that gravity was more or less then than it is today, for example. Or that dinosaurs had skeletons that were made of bones that were much stronger than any living animal. That would just be a kind of crazy guess. Here's a third example. We've looked at color, we've looked at running speed. What about bite force? So we all want to know, could T-Rex bite a car in half? And the answer is yes, very easily. So I don't know how many of you have experimented with the bite force of a lion or a great white shark. You can estimate the, the bite force by sticking your arm in their mouth. And whereas a human could bite your arm and maybe you could see some tooth marks, they could not bite your arm off completely. Whereas, of course, a lion could, a great white shark could, and certainly T-Rex could. So this is a diagram from the work of Bates and Falkingham, 2012, and they had a 3D model of a um, T-Rex skull shown in white. They reconstructed the main vectors of the jaw muscles shown in red. The pivot of the jaw is here at the back shown in blue, so the jaw works as a simple lever, of course, open and shut, and the pieces of yellow are meant to be pieces of food. And so once they had established the material properties of bone and, and the, 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 the force that could be exerted by all of those different jaw muscles, this, this is the range of bite forces that they estimated, which is, I think, roughly equivalent to three and a half to six tons of force, equivalent body mass uh, uh, forces. And you can see that these forces of more than 50,000 newtons are much, much greater than the great white shark. So there is no doubt. Now, can we trust this calculation? Well, I would say you could. And the argument comes from my colleague in Bristol, uh, Emily Rayfield, uh, who is a professor, and she has worked on 
uh, engineering properties of dinosaur bones over, over the years. And she uses a method called finite element analysis, FEA. Um, and the reason that this is regarded as a good method is that it has been used by engineers um, for maybe 60 or 70 years in designing all kinds of structures like um, high-rise buildings, uh, bridges, aeroplanes. And the diagrams on the left are FEA diagrams of a building and an aeroplane. And before anybody attempts to build one of these modern structures, they do an FEA analysis. And this requires an exact three-dimensional model of the structure, aeroplane, bridge, high-rise building. And they have to also, importantly, code or, or report in the model the physical properties of the materials that are going to be used. And this is how modern architects can test the strength of a building and they can substitute materials. They can say, okay, let's build this thing out of concrete. And then they discover, no, this isn't good enough because if there is a high wind, it may blow, blow over. So they then say, we will introduce some steel structures into this to, to strengthen the building and give it some flexibility. So if the wind is blowing, the building can bend. And it's the same with aircraft design. If you want to replace parts of the aircraft with uh, modern uh, composite plastics, for example, to save weight, you obviously have to be sure that the plane is not going to break into pieces. And the way to do that is by FEA. And so having coded the material properties, then you can apply forces. And in these diagrams, red always indicates a very high stress and blue indicates a low stress. So you can see in the aeroplane, there's high stress at the, the tip of the nose and along the wing. So I guess because of the distribution on the wing, this thing is turning to the left. And in the case of the T-Rex skull, which Emily studied a few years ago, the process is fairly straightforward. You take your T-Rex skull, you CT scan it so you have a 3D model, you repair the model so that every part is present and you remove any distortion. You then uh, turn it into a, a grid. These are the finite elements, so just like the building or the plane. You turn your skull into a, a kind of network. You can think of this as a three-dimensional wire model. Uh, each element then can be given the material properties that are appropriate. And in some, for example, the teeth have different uh, properties than the bone. And in different parts of the skull, the bone may be compact or may be open. Once she's done all that, she applies forces. And you can see in different situations, biting here, there's maximum force at the bottom. Twisting at the top, there's maximum force all around the size. And so you can assess the properties of any structure like a skull. Why would we believe these results that uh, Bates and Falkingham got, that Emily Rayfield got, for the same reason that you climb into an aeroplane and you trust that it is not going to break up into pieces? We trust that FEA works uh, in the modern examples. It works with modern skulls. People have applied it to the human skeleton. The whole business of designing replacement um, parts like knees and hips is based on designing them using these methods. We trust it works. Why would it not work in the Jurassic or the Cretaceous? I'm going to finish briefly with just a, a few shorter examples where I won't explain things in quite so much detail. So we've already seen examples of three, uh, three studies that we can do on dinosaurs. And of course, we can equally do these on fossil trees or trilobites or brachiopods or foraminifera or anything you like. And we've seen that in each case, we have evidence we have evidence for the color of dinosaur feathers. We have evidence for the running speed of dinosaurs. We have evidence for the bite forces of dinosaurs. Uh, and indeed, those methods can be applied to any other um, question about color where melanin is involved or questions about structural strength. Um, and so we're using uh, observations in the present day together with uh, computational methods, smart computational methods, imaging, CT scans, all of these methods we, we, we can now apply to the fossils and benefiting from wonderful fossils. And we're able to say things for sure. 
that maybe a few years ago people would say, yeah, maybe T-Rex could run at five kilometers per, per, per hour or maybe 50 kilometers per hour, maybe 500, who knows? You can choose. Now we can actually say for sure. So what about growing up? Look at these growth curves, figure B at the bottom. These are growth curves for T-Rex and its relatives. Here's Tyrannosaurus and some other genera of Tyrannosaurids. And what we have is on the x-axis is the age of the dinosaur in years from 0 to 30, the body mass in kilograms, so this rep represents 0 tons, 6 tons, remember T-Rex grows to 6 tons, so here's an adult T-Rex, and it's something like 27 years old. Um, and you can see the growth curve, let's follow the black curve, so T-Rex is really quite small, it's only a matter of a few kilograms when it's even up to five years. Even at 10 years old, it's maybe only 70 kilos, like human size. And, and then by 15 years old, it's reached one ton. But then it grows quite rapidly. And by 20, it's already three tons. By, or even, yeah, by 22 or so, it's about five tons. And so here are examples that the, the black squares are uh, uh, actual specimens. So how do we get the x-axis and the y-axis? So first of all, the age in years comes from counting bone rings in the limbo. So in all, the, here, here's a growth series, four years old, 10 years, 21 years. So researchers, including Greg Erickson and, and other people, have taken uh, examples of dinosaur bones, they cut them, They've, they've looked at thin sections under the microscope, and you can see in this case some fairly clear growth lines. And with care, counting them, you can pretty confidently get the age. And so for a 25-year-old, there should be maybe 20 rings, maybe not 25, because actually this structure in the middle of the bone uh, it gets larger, of course, as the animal grows bigger. So in fact, when you look at a cross-section of the adult limb bone, it may well have lost the first three or four years of growth on the inside. And I think you can understand why that would be. And the core of this leg bone would be full of fat and blood vessels and nerves. And, and the um, blood vessels and other structures go right through the bone. Um, and, and they're depositing bone as the animal gets bigger and bigger. Um, so how do we get the, so that's how we get the um, x-axis. And then from the same limb bone, we estimate the body mass. And this is done by looking at the overall size of the skeleton. And you can, you can find a fairly simple formula in most cases that connects, uh, for example, the length of the femur, or, or better, even the breadth of the femur or the circumference, to the body mass. Because the size is just like in humans. You, you, uh, a medical student can easily look at any bone from a human skeleton and pretty quickly tell you the age of the um, individual. Oh, this was a 15-year-old. This was an adult. You know, once they're adult, of course, generally they stop growing. But up to adult, you, you learn that. And so people working on tyrannosaurs have a formula. They can estimate from bone sizes what the estimated body mass is. That's then cross-checked. Maybe you, you have a formula for the femur, you have a formula for the tibia, you have a formula for the humerus. And if you have a complete skeleton, you can therefore use a number of independent formulae to calculate the body mass. And you keep doing this and you hope to get some sort of agreement between those. And so this is how, from a single bone, we can read both the age and the body mass. We look at lots of skeletons of different body sizes and you get the growth curves. And then you can estimate that sexual maturity would maybe happen halfway up this phase of fast growth. So in T-Rex, they become capable of breeding somewhere between 15 and 20 years old. Whereas the smaller ones, you can see the, 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 the rise is, is somewhat earlier, maybe between 10 and 15 years. That's growing up. And I should say there are nests, there are eggs. Many of you will know the uh, Alca Mahuevo location in Brazil, where you can, uh, where there's a great deal of information about the eggs, whole eggs with eggshells, with babies inside. You, you, the babies are born with teeth. That tells us that as soon as they hatch, they're going to be foraging. They're not being looked after by the parents. So you can read a lot of information from the fossils. That's growing up. Huge size. How did they get to be so huge? This is due to the work of Martin Sander and colleagues at the University of Bonn in Germany. 
And I won't describe this diagram in huge detail, but this is a really neat and, and wonderful summary of, of a very large scale study that Sander and colleagues, maybe 30 or 40 colleagues in Germany, were looking at all kinds of aspects of the huge size of the sauropod dinosaurs. These are the giant dinosaurs like this one here. This is Brachiosaurus, which could get to 50 tons, even 70 tons. They are the biggest. How on earth did they survive? Some people say it's because gravity in the Jurassic was a lot less than it is today. Other people say it's because they lived underwater and they just floated about. They are surely wrong because they are just inventing excuses to try and explain it. And there's a bunch of reasons we read across the bottom here. They produce many small offspring, so they're not like an elephant. Think of the effort for an elephant mother to produce a baby. The mother has to hold the baby inside her for two years, gestation of two years. The baby is then born, and it's pretty huge, but, and it can keep up with the herd of adult elephants. But it still has to be looked after by the mother and the other adults for many, many years before it can look after itself. Dinos that's a very costly thing to do. Dinosaurs were 10 times as big. These dinosaurs were 10 times as big as an elephant. Imagine if they did that. They'd be giving birth to a baby that maybe weighed five or ten tons. So the baby would be the size of an adult elephant. And that would just be a crazy amount of energy. So, in fact, they lay eggs. Uh, and, and this Brachiosaurus probably laid, at, like the sauropods at Acamajuevo, they maybe would lay 20 eggs. And guess what? They probably just leave them. They, they just walk away. Or, or they maybe hang around to watch, but they, they don't particularly care for the young as far as we know. They produce many small offspring, a lot of which will sadly die, just like baby crocodiles, and they're, they're not cared for, but enough of them survive. That saves energy. Number two, they don't chew their food. They don't have uh, stomach stones, but nonetheless, they just swallow food as fast as they can. So in a way, this is bad. You would think they have teeth, but they cannot really chew the food. The jaws just open and shut like a simple lever. Blah, 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 blah. They don't chew. They don't have stomach stones like a bird. So they just follow the food, for, but at least swallow the food. This is fast food uptake. And a small head, this, this looks counterintuitive. You think if you've got a big body, you need a huge head with big mouth so you can eat a load of food. These things are eating plants. They have an avian style lung. This is super efficient. Some of you will know that birds today have a kind of one way breathing system. So we have a tidal system, meaning you breathe in, the air goes in, into your lungs, and then of course, oxygenated uh, blood passes into all around the body and back it comes to the lungs and you breathe out. But each time you breathe in and out, maybe a third of that air sits in the lungs. It's kind of dead space. Whereas in birds, they breathe in, the air goes into the lung, but it quickly passes through the lung into air sacs, which are all around the, uh, the, the, the thorax, all around the body region. And we know for a fact, because of holes in the bones, that these sauropod dinosaurs had air sacs partway up the neck, all around the sides of the backbone, uh, and even coming around the sides of the body. So they breathe in, down this long neck, into the lungs, passes into the air sacs, oxygen is extracted and passed out to the body, and then uh, deoxygenated blood comes back, and then the, the air goes through a system and then back out. And so it, it's a kind of one-way system, avian-style lung. And high basal metabolic rate, they are warm-blooded. They, they are not cold-blooded. And the end point of all of this is that they eat one tenth of the amount of food that a mammal of the same size has to eat. So in fact, this 50 ton dinosaur eats the same amount of plant food each day as a five ton elephant. The five ton elephant has to keep walking and moving and walking and moving to find food uh, and cannot stop. It's going to be eating, eating, eating all the time because it has a uh, it, it has a different kind of warm-blooded system which works like an inner furnace, developing the temperature and keeping it up. These dinosaurs developed their warm-bloodedness largely by being big. It was a much more passive process. And nine-tenths of the food that you eat and nine-tenths of the food that the elephant eats is for powering that internal furnace to develop the temperature. 
So these became huge because they save energy by not caring for their young. They actually save energy in a bizarre kind of way by swallowing the food fast, not by keeping it in the mouth like a cow and going, chew, 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 chew. And then after 10 minutes, they get to swallow it. They just scarf it up and swallow it down. Next lap, slurp it up, slurp it up. Um, avian style lung, high basal metabolic rate. They can survive, uh, they can reach this huge size in a way that mammals never could. Nearly there, origins of dinosaurs. In fact, I'll, I won't describe this in detail because this is a topic that uh, Max Langer and students work on a great deal. And there is fantastic evidence in uh, Brazil and in South America in general. And the whole of the origin of dinosaurs has been massively revised in the last number of years with the origins of most of the key groups actually happening in the early Triassic. Even though the oldest confirmed fossils of dinosaurs um, uh, 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 are, are um, uh, Carnian, mid-Carnian in age, the Ischugalasto formation of Argentina, the Santa Maria formation, the upper Santa Maria formation of Brazil. But even so, we know that they originated much earlier, and as did the pterosaurs all back down here. So a great deal of further new evidence coming from new discoveries and the final one, which again, I don't have time to describe, is that a lot of this was maybe triggered by mass extinctions. We know that extinctions were important at the very end of the dinosaurs, but they, they were given their opportunity because of the extinction event at 2.5, 2 million years ago. And then the pterosaurs and the dinosaurs and all their rest end in, in, in the uh, uh, conditions that existed at that time. Then there was this event at 2.3, 2 million years ago, uh, which was another mass extinction, which was then followed by a, a very sharp switch from wet to dry kinds of climates. And a lot of competitor animals died out at that time. And for various reasons, the dinosaurs and these other groups were able to survive in these new, quite dry conditions when the plants were, were conifers. They, they were not very uh, productive, not very nutritious, but they were able to survive that. And I think I'll miss that because we don't have time to go into this. In fact, dinosaurs in the Cretaceous seemingly did not benefit in any way from climatic uh, and floral changes at that time. They were maybe important in the Triassic, but it seems that dinosaurs were not particularly interested in the new flowering plants of the Cretaceous. And then finally, of course, there's a load of new work on the uh, uh, end of the dinosaurs. And again, this could be a whole lecture. We know it was caused ultimately by the impact of a huge asteroid, the Chicxulub uh, crater in Mexico. And in fact, recent work, and there's even more recent work published just uh, a month ago, suggesting quite strongly that um, in the latest Cretaceous, maybe the last 20 to 40 million years of the existence of the dinosaurs, they were already going into some kind of decline. The extinction was definitely caused by the asteroid, but various of the groups were already declining in, 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 um, species, in, in, in diversification rate. And so this is where it all is. So what I've talked about today is represented in this book, which was published a couple of years ago, paperback last year. I don't believe there is a Portuguese or Brazilian edition. I do apologize. But uh, if you're interested in that, you can follow up a little further. So I think I'd better stop there and, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, it was a wonderful talk as usual. Um, we will open the chat in uh, YouTube to see if there are questions from people that are listening. But uh, we already have some that were sent to us. Uh, one of them uh, is from my colleague, Lisa Pacheco, how to differentiate uh, the melanosomes from uh, possible bacteria that would be uh, acting in the, in the carcass. Yes, that's a very good question, which many people have posed, because um, the structures that we are calling melanosomes were often interpreted as bacteria um, previously. Um, and you find bacteria in exceptionally preserved um, uh, fossil tissues. The reason that we're confident they are melanosomes is that they occur only within the keratin of the feather or the hair. 
They don't occur generally scattered around the whole carcass. And in examples like the sinusoroptrix that we showed, you can see within the matrix of the feather, the impressions of the melanosomes that are there. There, you see some of them as, as solid objects and a lot of them as, as hollow molds pressed into the keratin. And we don't know of any bacteria that would only go into the keratin of the fossil and somehow burrow into the keratin and multiply. When people find bacteria on exceptionally preserved fossils, for example, in the Santana Formation, the bacteria go into the muscle and they can replace the soft tissue but they're also found more generally scattered around in, in the matrix as well. Okay, thank you. Mike, um, one thing that puzzles me is uh, also the sort of uh, numerical revolution that we are having in paleontology. When you look at those big data sets with paleobiodiversity and you can estimate the diversification and biogeography and stuff like that, um, what, what do you think are the next steps in this uh, uh, approach in paleontology, like taking uh, data sets and try to identify posts of evolution and stuff like that? I think that there's, there's at the moment there are a number of um, separate activities going on. Um, and I think it's good that we have multiple approaches. Um, and I think a lot of these um, big data studies, for example, our study of the decline of dinosaurs in the late Cretaceous, um, they depend on, in some cases, they, they depend on having a, a good phylogenetic tree, although some of the methods, for example, the ones we used in our recent paper in Nature Communications, can be done without a phylogeny. But very many of them, of course, are mapping trait evolution. You may know the traits like, I don't know, body size or diet or geographic distribution or running speed or anything you like. Each of these is a species. We can draw the phylogenetic tree. Uh, there are now multiple methods of estimating ancestral states. Of course, the, many of those are quite controversial. And I think, but, but nonetheless, people are developing new methods all the time. And I think a lot of these allow us to do the one big controversial issue we always face is the quality of the data. And so there are always going to be big, big questions about any of these studies um, because you've got multiple pieces of evidence that you have to um, establish. Do we believe that this is the correct phylogeny? Do we believe we have got the correct dating of that tree because you, you, you have to somehow date the thing against geological time? Do we believe we're estimating the biological traits correctly, for example, body mass or, or running speed or whatever it is you're trying to study? And, but most importantly, the really big one is, are we sure that we are sampling the fossil record adequately? For example, for our study of Cretaceous dinosaurs, we looked at all dinosaurs, not just in the Cretaceous. I think we had a a dated time tree, a cladogram of maybe five or 600 species of dinosaurs. This is pretty much every described dinosaur. But it's very easy for somebody to say, yeah, yeah, you've maybe got 600 dinosaurs, but what if there were 10,000 dinosaurs? You've only got a very small sample. We would say to some extent, as long as your sample is distributed randomly across the phylogeny, you're okay. Because in many studies of living organisms, for example, if people study the evolution of modern birds, there are 10,000 species, and yet a lot of the studies don't include every one of those 10,000 species. They may even only have 200 species, but if they are scattered evenly across the tree, it's okay. And I think the, the fossil preservation question is, is really serious. It's a tricky one. Um, and there are two answers to that. One is that we, by drawing a tree, you're beginning to link between isolated fossils and, and you're discovering the origins of major groups at different times. And secondly, in the two studies we have, stu we have published, the uh, Sakamoto and Condomine, in both cases, we ran those using Bayesian software. And so I think some of these Bayesian techniques will be really helpful because they allow you to 
muddle a whole number of different uncertainties. And you, you're, you're often running the calculation millions or even billions of times. So I think in both those cases, we were doing billions of calculations. Each calculation, you perturb the data. You change a date, you change a position of a fossil, you change something about the uh, preservation. You can calculate preservation. So I think, yeah, data calculations are going to get bigger. That's the easy answer. And the second answer is um, we have to be very alert to the, the, the problems. Um, but my attitude has always been be alert, but don't stop. Be alert, but don't stop. Because I think some of the critics would say, stop, 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 stop all this stuff. You can't do any of this. And they said this at the beginning of the cladistic revolution. No, 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 you can't draw cladograms of fossils. This is crazy. You don't have the molecules or you don't have enough fossils. Stop immediately. Stop, stop. But I think we just have to carry on and uh, be aware of the problems. And there are great people out there writing software. And it's all, most of it is free. Most of it's quite easy to use. And I think I always encourage students to just try. Mike, uh, when I was an undergrad student in, in ecology, I, I ran away from ecology because it included a lot of math, a lot of statistics, and I, I, I was hiding in the in paleontology. Uh, I don't think I would be able to do that anymore in those <laughs> days. So the question is, uh, can you be a real paleontologist now if you don't get into statistics, statistics and stuff like that? Yes, I think, you know, for example, our studies of dinosaur color were not technical, did not involve computation, simply used a, a scanning electron microscope. And I think a lot of great work is being done using 3D uh, CT scans and, and describing hidden anatomy. And this is a huge push at the moment, of course, is to scan small fossils and extract anatomical data that was hidden. Um, and I think, um, secondly, I guess some of the some of the computational methods are packaged in such a way that they're they're kind of foolproof. They're, they're proof against fools like myself. So, meaning the people who have written the software have made made it easy to use. A lot of the stuff I do is just in R. You upload the data; it kind of tells you what to do almost and and you just put in simple commands and it does it correctly it doesn't try to catch you out so i think um, it's just like cladistics it, it's it's what we would call to some extent a black box you feed in the data you learn a little bit of coding to make it do what you want but you don't actually know what it's doing and it could be doing crazy stuff and who knows what goes on within tnt and you get a result Uh, we trust that it is a correct result because I think good people are uh, uh, telling us that this is the case. And so, yeah, you're right. But I think you don't have to become a mathematician to become a successful paleontologist in the future. Yeah, that's how it uh, happens. Uh, Mike, another uh, issue is that uh, the, the role of paleontology in that extended evolutionary synthesis, like... Uh, um, When you got the, the modern synthesis back in the 70s, uh, paleontology was sort of pushed aside. Nobody, was, nobody uh, believed that we could actually bring new information to evolutionary processes. And now this is changing. How do you see uh, the contribution of paleontology to the extended synthesis? Yeah, that's a great question. The role of paleontology in evolution, bigger questions in biology. Um, and, of course, when I was growing up, Steve Gould was the main writer on that topic, and he was very passionate to argue, you know, paleontology can make a unique contribution. He particularly talked about two things, I guess, um, punctuated equilibrium uh, and mass extinctions. Uh, mass extinctions are easier to understand because, of course, there they are. They are there. They are big. There's lots of data they are the unique playground for paleontology. And I think we're putting it the other way. A geneticist probably could not predict mass extinctions based only on living organisms. Um, punctuated equilibrium, of course, in the years since Gould and Eldridge published this in the early 1970s, 
has had an interesting history. Sometimes people accept it, sometimes they don't. I think, though, it has opened up um, a, a realistic position now, which is we accept that um, a lot of complex organisms living in complex environments do evolve and speciate quite fast. Uh, it doesn't apply to uh, a, a, um, um, asexual organisms. It doesn't apply to marine plankton, which are kind of living in undivided habitats. But for fishes and mollusks and echinoderms and mammals, it seems to apply. So, and I guess the the the, the thing you, we were talking about a moment ago, you certainly wouldn't predict dinosaurs. So I suppose from a point of view of wonder, amazement. Um, extremes of physiology, that whole story of how dinosaurs could become really, really huge. I don't think we would even discuss that if we didn't have fossils. We would just say the elephant is as big as you can be. That's it. You can't be bigger than an elephant. Well, a whale, of course. On land, the elephant is the limit. And in the skies, the condor is the limit. You cannot be bigger than a condor and be able to fly. Wrong wrong. And, and that forces physiologists and forces mechanic, biomechanics experts to expand their, their views. So it's not just contributing to evolution, it's obviously contributing to, I would say, to other big fields in, in biology. And Mike, as a final question, um, why do you think the, the, the understanding of deep time changes uh, teaches us about our possible uh, ways into the future as a species, as a, a, a part of, of uh, the biological realm of this planet? Do you think paleontology has something to, to teach us in that respect? Yes, I think it does. And I think Charles Darwin recognized this. I think Charles Darwin wrote about um, studying biology, studying paleontology makes us humble. It, it, unlike uh, an attitude that may come from religion or literature where you think humans are best, we are top, we do everything right, and the whole world is available for us and for our convenience. This is one viewpoint. But I think Darwin argued, and of course, I think any natural scientist would agree the Earth is very small in the universe, um, and life has been around for a very long time. Human life is very recent, um, and so we need to respect uh, the Earth and respect life because we are just a very small part of that. And so I think all of those aspects of philosophy or uh, viewpoint come from a pure uh, consideration of natural science, including paleontology. And we hear that expressed by David Attenborough and everybody else who talks about um, the present crisis or the future. More particularly for the future, I think, um, yes, people want to know, will humans be around in a million years' time? Probably not, because we know that species last for about a million years, so Homo sapiens has been around for maybe 100,000. Yeah, we might just about be around in a million years' time. Probably not. Um, but not in five million years' time, because we'll have gone extinct or evolved into something else. Um, the Earth, yeah, I think we now can tell that a, a lot of there's a lot of criticism of um, futurology, particularly where people look at climate change and make predictions about what's happening in the future. But I think the the perspective of paleontology is hugely helpful because. The, the key evidence that IPCC presents for climate in the next year or the next 10 years comes from historical observations back to 1850, maybe. Um, and we know it's a fact that temperatures are getting higher by maybe one or more than one degree. Weather is changing. All of those things are facts. Species are going extinct. All of those things are predicted. We know what's happening. Looking at paleontology, though, we can, we can look at other scenarios so that if somebody asks a question a little differently and they maybe say, okay, let's accept that world temperatures will go up by five degrees or 10 degrees, what will the world look like? And we can say, okay, let's go back to the Cretaceous or let's go back to the Triassic. 
And so we can choose a time in the history of the earth when um, the, the, the temperature was whatever we want to know about. And it won't be a perfect picture because, of course, each point in history, the, the layout of the continents is different and the species on the earth are different. But, you know, we can look at those hothouse worlds of the Cretaceous and the Triassic and we can learn from those. And we certainly know one thing from extreme hothouse conditions like in the early Triassic, you get no life in the tropics. So the sort of 30 degrees north and south, nothing. So if people thought that was a wild speculation, you can actually go back in time and say, in the Triassic, when temperatures went up 10 degrees, life in the sea and on land moved away from the tropics and there was nothing. So we can we can learn some facts that, that may be of interest. Thank you, Mike. We have another uh, ask a question from the, the chat. It's uh, from a colleague of us, Professor Luis Aned. He's a quite uh, 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 important uh, person writing popular books in, in Brazil. And he's Max, asking how... Max, this... só, um, só um minuto, perdão. Uh, quem está assistindo, por favor, se quiser dar um F5 ou uma atualização da página, o chat se abrirá para fazerem as questões. Obrigado. Desculpa, Max. Okay. So, uh, Mike is asking how the study of dinosaurs uh, can help people uh, to learn science. Something that in this pandemic, we can see a lot of people denying science. So, how the study of dinosaurs that's so uh, uh, popular for children or people in general can help uh, in uh, bringing science close to people? I think... Um... Your, the, the, the interest kids have is really, really important because I think um, we all, as educators, we need to turn kids on to science. And you're quite right because this, many adults have a very poor uh, appreciation of how to read data and evidence and who to believe. Um, and so I think we have to start with kids. There are science jobs in every society. We want more people studying science and engineering. And dinosaurs are a great way in. And we, we go into schools, and I think the kind of lecture I gave just now, we can explain those things at a level that maybe a five- or six-year-old child can understand. You get them to run, and then you get them to walk, and you get them to measure stride lengths. And, and you know, you can actually demonstrate. And then they realize... I can observe stuff and, and I can do an experiment and, and, you know, I can do stuff even though I'm just a child. But also they learn and then we have, with the older kids, it becomes more like a sort of detective story. So you can say, okay, here's the evidence. Here are the dead bodies. What killed them? What were they doing? And again, the stories I was telling in my lecture are more adapted to older kids or adults and you can lead them through And I think almost everything we do, you can explain at any level, depending on who, who is listening. And the hope would be people would get the point. Okay, evidence. I get the point. We need evidence. We can't just kind of guess or listen to who shouts most. You know, we actually have to say, is that really true? Is that really true? And I guess the police argument, the forensic argument, is quite a good one because people understand the point, I think, that in... In law, if you claim somebody murdered somebody, you've got to have some evidence. You have to have a film or a photograph or a fingerprint or something. You can't just say, I don't like you. You go to prison. Um, and so the, the argument about science would be the same. Before you make a decision about vaccination or not, or a decision about whether to throw your plastic in the sea or not, look at the evidence. And, and what, what does it do? What, what are the consequences? And so, yeah, and I think we're very lucky that kids love dinosaurs. So even as you walk into the room, the teacher says, here is Dr. Dinosaur who's coming to talk to you. This is, it's so easy. It's not like you're coming in and saying, I'm going to teach you some calculus. It's great. You, you've got to work really hard to get the kids on side. But dinosaurs, they're just ready for it. You don't need to work hard at all. But I always try to you get those messages across about how do we know this stuff? I don't just say, this is what I'm telling you, blah, blah, blah. Uh, here's a picture. What do we know about this dinosaur? And the kids will answer, yeah, it's big. It eats meat. It does it. How do we know it eats meat? And, you know, you're beginning, sharp teeth. Ah, yeah, yeah, good, good. You know, you can see that. And that's logical and that's being scientific. 
so I think that that is a rather random answer, but um, and I suppose the final thing is paleontology uses every science. So the kids are not studying paleontology, but they will be studying mathematics, physics, chemistry, and so you can show them examples like body mass is, is or, or biting is, is simple lever mechanics and stuff like that. Excellent, Mike. Well, I think we don't have further questions in the chat. Uh, thank you very much for your time, for being with the Brazilian uh, people. And well, uh, sorry, Max. Oh. sorry. Uh, I think we have a, one question from Gustavo Prado. Yet. Oh, sorry. Let's see. Um, Mike, he's asking if um, um, you said that the color is related with the shape of the melanosomes. Uh, and he's saying that's not necessarily because um, there are spherical melanosomes with ill melanin. So is, is really a, a straight relation between shape of melanosomes and color, or is there some possibility that something is different there? I think the, the relationship I talked about seems to be um, absolute. We look at two things, which are the shape and the packing. And so the, the, the color comes from the shape, but that is related to the chemistry of the melanin inside. And so the shape of the melanosome is, is, is determined by the shape of the molecules within the particular pigment. So the different forms of melanin have different, uh, similar but different chemical structures. So the fundamental chemical structure is fixed according to each of those um, uh, pigments. And there are other forms of melanin, for example, in the ink sac of a cephalopod, it is CPO melanin, which is a chemically, again, a little bit different. The feathers of penguins have another kind of uh, melanin, um, and it has a slightly different shape melanosome. So there does seem to be, there are many different kinds of melanin, but the two I talked about are the key ones in mammals and birds. Uh, and the shape relationship seems to be fixed. Uh, and the other evidence that determines the intensity of the color, the difference between black and gray, is just simply how many. And so if there are loads of melanosomes tightly packed, you get a darker color than if there are fewer. Uh, but there are many other colors, of course, that are not in, in birds, not in mammals, but uh, birds have other colors that come from uh, pigments that are in their food, and, and those are harder to detect. And the final point, I guess, is that people are confirming, and back to the first question, they're confirming that these melanosomes are not bacteria uh, because there are also chemical tests. So you can analyze the fossilized melanin chemically, and that's independent of the melanosome shape. Uh, and you can determine, this is harder to do, and, and this is still developing, but you can determine the chemical structure matching to the shapes and um, that tends to confirm well we we have another question here mike it's a bit tricky <laughs> one to be honest but it's in the chat so i'm going to do it uh last week we had a description of a new brazilian dromaeosaurid um and the holotype was destroying do that uh, during that fire uh, uh in museo nacional uh, yeah. So the National Museum, Museum in Brazil, yeah. a couple of years ago. Uh, so some people say that it's not important to describe this specimen. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, um, not very informative and even a destroyed specimen. Should we bother about publishing? Well, I think yes, but <laughs> I'll, I'll leave you. The, 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 I agree. The, the, I agree. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, just because of, yeah. So number one is... It's awful, it's terrible when any uh, museum collection is destroyed because, and particularly that, because it was your national museum, it already contained fantastically important world-class collections. This is not just this crisis, this catastrophe was not just bad for Brazil, it's bad for the world because there were many, many type specimens, unique specimens, not just fossils, but also modern plants and animals. In terms of information, once something is published, providing you, 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 should, you should give good photographs, good drawings, scans of the specimen, you can use the publication. So, of course, the fact that any specimens may have been destroyed 
is terrible. Um, but it doesn't mean that the scientific work that was done before becomes unimportant uh, in any way. Uh, and and um, so all of that work is still there. It still has the same value. Of course, unfortunately, nobody can then go back and cross-check with the specimen. But we hope, and people are now trying to document better and better, museums are trying to scan everything so that there should be 3D digital images and excellent color photographs and stuff. Um, but no, it's always been the case. People assume that once the paper is published, the species is named, um, that the, that is a correct position. Thank you. Uh, there are a lot of uh, greetings in the chat here. And well, this time I'm going to close up our uh, meeting. Thank you, Mike, very much again for your time and for being with us. And okay, have a good rest of the week and a good recovery from these strange times we are facing. <laughs> Indeed. And, and best wishes to you and all colleagues in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much, Professor. Okay, thank you very much. Renato, está transmitindo ainda? Sim, está transmitindo. Eu acho que é só para a gente terminar, né? Avisando aos participantes do, do Eximpa que vamos ter nosso hoje à tarde mais algumas palestras, né? De, de conhecimento geral. O link vai estar disponível no canal do YouTube, tá? Como transmissão ao vivo. E a partir de amanhã, o, os alunos do Eximpa vão receber, assim como os professores também, os links de transmissão das suas aulas pelo nosso canal do Telegram, tá bom? Então, Eu é... acho importante ressaltar que é, não é realmente para seguir o link que está nas imagens de divulgação, porque agora o link realmente mudou. Isso. Eu coloquei o link disponível no Facebook, no Twitter no Instagram e no LinkedIn. Então, ah, para a tarde é só consultar ali. As duas horas começam. As Isso duas aí. horas. Então, até mais, gente.